You're listening to Nakedly Examined Music, a podcast about songs and songwriters. My name is Mark Lintenmeyer. My guest for episode 144 is Dennis Davison. He started in the late 70s in a punk band called Ebenezer and the Bludgeons. And after relocating from Baltimore to Los Angeles and a couple other groups that we'll mention, he caught nine albums as leader of The Jigsaw Scene between 1989 and 2015. You're right now listening to Jim is the Devil, their first single from 1989. He's just released his first solo album, The Book of Strongman, 2020. We'll be talking about the song Museum Piece from that. And going back to the last full Jigsaw Scene album, Old Man Reverb 2014, the song is Idiots with Guitars. And then look all the way back to the first full album, My Name is Tom 1991. We'll talk about the title track. Finally, we'll hear the single from the new album, Shadow of a Tall Tree. For more information, please see DennisDavisonMusic.com. For more about this podcast, make sure to subscribe directly at NakedlyExaminedMusic.com. And to support the effort, you can go to Patreon.com slash NakedlyExaminedMusic to get this ad-free with my show notes so you can follow along. So I will play a little bit of Jim is the Devil, a 1989 single before the first Jigsaw Scene album. But I understand that you were active a whole 10 years before that. In fact, I was just listening to some Ebenezer and the Bludgeons on YouTube, <laughs> which is straight up punk, you know, in 1978. It's still within the window of authentic punk. Were you in high school, college at the time? Yeah, I was 17 when I started that band. We started in 1977. and ended that band in 1980. Okay. Yeah, we were based in Baltimore. Yeah, we played all, all the hot spots back then. We did a few New York trips, played CBGBs and Max's Kansas City towards the end. I got inspired by the whole punk scene and that, that was it for me. I wasn't able to find anything to listen to by the playground, your band in, in, in between. However, the United States of Existence had its, its collection released in 1994, which by then you're already fully on the 60s retro thing that we hear in this early, you know, what we just heard in Jim is the Devil a little bit. That seems a strange thing to be sort of in the moment punk. And now we're going back to something from 15 years earlier. Can you say a little about that choice of stylish transition? Well, I think by the time punk seemed to be dying, you know, late 79, maybe I was realizing how limiting the music was and, you know, it was so exciting at the beginning, but like most things, it just sort of loses its inspiration, really, you know, and it just, it wasn't doing it for me anymore. So I think I was thinking about more of becoming a songwriter at that point, just wanted to write songs that could just hold up no matter what genre of music you were playing them in. And during that time, I got approached at, at one of our shows by this guy who said he was doing this psychedelic thing and was interested in he said they needed a singer for it. It was just a studio project. So I, I was open to anything then. So I said, yeah, sure. It sounds good. So he gave me a tape with like blues magoos and electric prunes and that sort of thing. And I thought it was cool. So I said, yeah, let's do it. So that was the United States of Existence. And Paul Rieger was the guy behind that and Bob Tiefenworth and Gary Schwartz, who later played in the jigsaw scene. So the playground was going on all during that? No. After Ebenezer and the Bludgeons, I had a band called Alter Legion. And it sort of was getting more into songs and, you know, less about the, the whole punk energy thing. All this was happened simultaneously, the end of the Bludgeons and, and Alter Legions and, and being approached by the United States of Existence guys. So I recorded an album with them and came out on an English label, Bam Caruso. And then Alter Legion ended... We actually moved to California, to Los Angeles, and we only lasted like three months, and the band broke up. This was 1982. Then I did this single that was actually produced by Paul from United States of Existence, and I called that single The Playground. That was when I decided to move to California for good, and the band that I formed here was called The Playground, which really evolved into the jigsaw scene. We changed the name because we had recorded our first album. And before it came out, we discovered there were a couple of bands that were already called The Playground. So we changed it to the Jigsaw scene, and that was it. We did that for only 30 years. Yes, so nine albums later, last band album being 2014. We're going to hear something off later. First solo album, finally 2020. We're going to talk about this song, Museum Piece. Can you say a little about the six-year ramp up to this album and what this song in particular is going to be? Well, this album started off when the band ended i just wanted to start recording immediately so i got some equipment and i really just i really made most of this album at home 
I just kind of let it evolve naturally as far as what songs I use for it and everything. But the song in particular, a museum piece, it really started off, I just wanted to write a song about a museum. I was thinking about, you know, Donovan had a song called Museum that I that I always liked. And I thought, well, what is this going to be? So it's kind of a romantic, an inanimate object as a romantic interest, I guess. Some of the lyric looks like it could be maybe a statue, maybe something from the Natural History Museum. It's not really clear. But then I thought about what is a museum? A museum is kind of your brain, your memories, you know, and everything you've done in your life is in there. It's stored away. So it kind of combines those elements. Yeah, so this nice kind of low, lush, classical sounding thing. You said you did most of this at home. Were there drum machines on all the tracks and then you replaced some of them with real drums, but not this one because the drum machine was fine? Is that the story here? 
This one, I always had a drum machine in mind for it. I had been listening to Robin Gibbs' album that he recorded in 1969, Robin's Rain. It's an album that's like really lush with orchestration, you know, real strings and everything. But he uses a drum machine, a rhythm-based drum machine on, I think, three or four songs. So you get these really lush orchestrated songs with a drum machine. And I thought that combination was really interesting. I bought a rhythm ace from a guy in, in Montreal just before I started recording the album. And I thought, okay, Museum Piece would really be a perfect song for this rhythm ace drum machine. And I always had in mind for the song for it to kind of sound like a music box song come to life. And I think the drum machine gives it that mechanical feel. Well, and the nice little high glockenspiel synth sound. That, that's one of the easiest good synth sounds to make. Like, it's not a lot better to actually get real bells or something because it's the nice little plunking at the top. All the strings on this on that song are the Mellotron. There's a glockenspiel Mellotron. Like a patch, a Mellotron patch, or you have an actual Mellotron in your house? No, I have a Mellotron. So this is way more low tech than I, than I suspected. Is this real bass at least? Yeah, everything is real except the, well, the Mellotron instruments are real. Sure, sure, of course. It was all the Lawrence Welk Orchestra that recorded those. Not played with, with a finger is what I'm saying. <laughs> it's <laughs> yes, a bass it's, guitar. Okay. And it's real bass and real guitar. And and you seem to be very fond of the, is it just a very tight tremolo on the guitar or is that a chorus? What Do you remember what? It is a phase. It's phase. Oh, okay. So this main minor key riff, let me just pull it out here. The fact that you've got this nice, lush, driving through the country estate or whatever sort of string thing, and then it settles to this, that's got to be a quote from a particular 60s. Do you know where that particular riff came from? Obviously, it's simple enough. It's not... <laughs> Like, even if it's lifted, it's fine. If I, <laughs> what are you accusing me of? <laughs> Should I have my lawyer with me? If I did steal that, I'm not aware of where I stole it from. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's just something that I came up with. It's just a nice little centering thing that we're going to just kind of, you've got this big, vast sound and now we're going to strip down to, dun, 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 you know, kind of a folk thing to just. Doesn't everybody strip a song down to guitar and glockenspiel eventually? <laughs> You've got a couple songs here where I think the chorus is starting, but I'm not really sure. It's just some nice transitions. Yeah, I mean, it's just one line to, to swoosh into here. Any thoughts about your methodology in, in getting this chord progression together? Was this all written in one stretch? Were you patching bits of things together for this? That's a good question. Sometimes I don't remember exactly how... Uh, you know, the process when I write a song, sometimes I remember every detail. This one, I probably came up with the chorus in this song first. Yeah, I definitely came up with the chorus first. So even the lyric of that first, or was the lyric sort of just a, I've got a page? The lyric and the um, chord progression and uh, arrangement usually come kind of simultaneously. Like I'll have a bit of the lyric and, you know, a bit of the melody and then I just sort of play it and over and over and over and see what part it will flow into next, where it should go melodically. The riff, I don't really remember coming up with that riff that you talked about before. So that could have been something added even during the recording process? No, no, it was it was part of the song, definitely. But I just don't remember coming up with it. But um, yeah, it's just sort of one of those songs. It just felt like everything flowed and it was, you know, it seemed everything seemed natural to me. I didn't like uh, Frankenstein, any parts from other songs I've been working on or something like that. It just it was all something that new that popped into my head. Sure. There's just some nice section transitions in, in there, even though, you, you know, got a very consistent mood through the whole thing. Actually, do you know, I was hearing Gene Clark solo stuff in terms of your vocal delivery, this kind of deliberate, slightly mournful tone. Do you know what you're channeling at this point or that's just what's coming out? Well, I've been called slightly mournful. So <laughs> yeah, that's just me. Yeah, I, I really like Gene Clark, but I didn't think of that for this song, but I, I can hear that now. Yeah. Echoes, that sort of thing, maybe. One sure. Of orchestrated things. Yeah. Probably everything I've ever heard and listened to, it's just, you know, it's all in your head. So. Who knows what's going to come out when you're writing a song. Let's play some of the bridge about 218 here. Keep 
So I like how it goes into a kind of little groove there. Like it doesn't seem like it can because it's so slow, but just what you're doing on the bass and adding the little, is that wood blocks or is that again a... Claves. Some claves. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It does kind of do that. It gets a little less lush there and gets a little more groovy, I'd say. Still with the uh, mechanical drum machine going. Well, and you've introduced a little, it's a little tension in here. Keep your distance. She'd (laughs) surely crumble if she took a fall. The whole thing is kind of, I want to say low stakes, but I think your description of contemplating something in a museum, I'm glad to hear that that was what your inspiration was as opposed to a really mean song about a person. That was my initial interpretation is this is like a love song to somebody that you don't really like that much. (laughs) This is my only song that is that. (laughs) That is not that, rather. (laughs) This is kind of a sentimental song, I would say. It's a lot of things, I guess. It's definitely not a mean song. Well, let's think about the ending here. You add an extra chord here to just give a little transition so you can repeat this a couple times. Well, you're obviously a musician. Nobody (laughs) would notice that I added a chord there. Is this the kind of thing that comes out as... It might be you're varying this and trying out different things as you're actually putting the recording down as to how you're going to actually end this thing. There are lots of ways. You could repeat the whole chorus again. You could do a repeat thing for the last. It could have gone quite a bit longer. Add some more orchestrated lushness or something. Yeah, I mean, there are a million ways to do a song. So you just go with your instincts on what would work best for this particular song. And it's not always what would be best commercially or best what people might respond to. It's just what you like, what you would like to hear in a song. So I just thought repeating that part, we shall never be released over a few times. And you had to add this passing chord with it to make it make sense to keep that going around. Well, then let's hear the very end. So you repeat that one minor key riff again, but more orchestrated. That what was so kind of stripped down is now, okay, now you're harmonizing it. And actually it's the drum machine is really the last, gets to have the last word that you could have just stopped that on the one, Mm -hmm. but like, let's finish the measure at least. Well, the song starts out with the drum machine. So I figured it, it would be nice to end it and give the drummer some spotlight, you know. But yet not have, let's finish the chord and let it go for another two measures, you know, not the Phil Collins. No, 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 no Phil Collins in here. <laughs> but, you know, when I listen to that now, I realize, I remember now, when I was recording this, the guitar riff at the end of the song that you were just talking about, I add the Mellotron to it this time, and it makes it, it reminds me of the music where they play at graduations. Oh, Pomp and Circumstance. Pomp and Circumstance, yeah. Melodically, it kind of reminds me a little bit when you add the strings to it. Sure. And what's more Pomp and Circumstance than a museum? Well, and now I'm wanting to hear Pomp and Circumstance with a little drum machine. <laughs> Let's hear that. <laughs> I'm sure in the 80s, somebody did it. Somebody did it, yeah. <laughs> Rock me, Pomp and Circumstance. Let us stop for a moment for our sponsor break. I am pleased once again to be supported by Nebia by Moen, a revolutionary way to upgrade your shower head. Because it's the pandemic, there's not a lot going on. You deserve something fancy and new like this. It has a really innovative design. It just completely consumes you. It's 81% more powerful than the competition. Really feels like you are in a spa. And the second thing you have to know is water savings. The Nebia by Moen Shower Spa uses 45% less water. You can go online and calculate your savings. This calculator will show that it will pay for itself in less than a year. So good for your pocketbook and, of course, saving the planet. And I got the one that has the wand. You can pull it off. You can spray your feet. And the Nebia by Moen is available in four premium finishes to complement any bathroom, white and chrome, spot resin, nickel, matte black, and black and chrome. You owe it to yourself to at least go check this out. And while you're at their site, check out their shower shelves, their shower curtain, their bath mat. All these things are very sustainable and as innovative as you would expect, given that they're backed by some of the biggest names in Silicon Valley. They have Tesla, NASA, and Apple engineers. Everything is ridiculously researched. This is a real labor of love to these people. The Nebia by Moen Shower Spa starts at just $199, and for Nakedly Examined Music listeners... 
we have a deal for you. The first 100 people to use the code NEM at Nebbia.com will get 15% off all Nebbia products. Nebbia really does deals like this, so this is a great deal to jump on. Go to Nebbia.com slash NEM. That's N-E-B-I-A dot com slash NEM to check out what they have to offer. The first 100 people to use the code NEM when checking out will save 15% off all Nebbia products. Again, that's Nebbia.com slash NEM. Use that code NEM to save 15%. Let's get the second song out there to hear more of your range here. So this is Idiots with Guitars back from the last Jigsaw Scene album, Old Man Reverb 2014, a very peppy album overall. Do you want to say a little about that record and this song? There was actually one more Jigsaw Scene album after that. Oh, okay. Jigsaw Scene for the Discriminating Completist. It's a compilation, so I wasn't, oh, I wasn't but, including that, but yes. <laughs> what a purist. Jeez. <laughs> but it does have one new song on it. It wasn't on any other albums. It's something that I think every musician probably can relate to. If you can't, then you've been very lucky in your musical career. You just have to go about it blindly sometimes. You know, you can't really look at the big picture when you're trying to make music. It can be very depressing and um, it can kill you. You know, (laughs) a lot of people have committed suicide over their music careers. You have to turn your logical mind off to play music, really, and to, to try to make a living and try to do anything with ambition. Unless you're, do- you know, if you're doing it for yourself, just you don't really care about any sort of success or feedback or whatever. That, that's fine. But once you get into the music business part of it, you have to really just turn on your idiot self and just pursue it blindly. Guitar 
I don't want to give people the impression that you only write slow songs. We just happen to pick those for these first two. <laughs> these are, for the most part, very uh, bouncy albums, as we'll hear in the rest of this interview. But these two go together nicely. You were, you were saying that by the end of Museum Piece, well, you've turned it around. It's not she will never be released. It's we will never be released. Can you say a little more about that sentiment in that song of sort of being, I'm seeing the same theme that is in Idiots with Guitars of sort of being captured in these set ways that, well, in the case of Idiots with Guitars that you say you sort of need to be in to survive in the industry. I don't know. I never really thought of the two tunes together, but I mean, they do have a similar, not really even the feel of it, but I think they both have maybe a sense of loneliness and maybe they both describe how, you know, it's not just me, it's just people kind of feel that way in their lives. And it's just maybe described in different ways with each of these songs. Well, and this one, so it's a similar kind of vocal delivery, which you have very different ones on different songs. It's, I don't know that I would necessarily recognize your voice on everything. Certainly not going back to the Ebenezer stuff. <laughs> but oh, well, yeah, it's a completely a... different, but even within Jigsaw Scene, there's a, do you tend to, to double track your voice a lot or it's just make sure it's beefy reverb to make it sound vaguely sixties or? I think I used to double track a lot more now than I do now. Most of the songs on the on the new album are not double tracked. Museum piece is in the choruses double tracked. I think the choruses are double tracked. I'm not sure about the ver I don't think the verses are. So when we do hit the chorus in Idiots with Guitars, you get this grand I wasn't even sure what all was filling the space there. I mean you've got your acoustic strumming, you've got your the bass and the electric sort of emphasizing the chord changes, these these grand sounding drums. Is there organ and like Beach Boys harmonica and like ah in the vocal? Like uh, you pretty much got it. There's no Beach Boys harmonica, but there is <laughs> low ah uh, ah uh, vocals, you know, low ah uh, vocals for the chorus. And there's a Hammond organ that comes in there too. All right. I was hearing something in the, the yeah. maybe it's just the vocals were, were filling that harmonica ish range for me. That's exactly the range. Yeah. Take the smarts like Joan of Arc to the fire. <laughs> it is with guitars, center stage and all alone in the dark. You write the song so that it is completely self-contained, even playing solo, and then you bring it to the band and let them fill it up. Is that the standard? Or by this time, were you writing things that were purposefully sparse because you know that they're going to come up with a lot of stuff? Well, I've always written songs as completely as I could. If you played this for somebody, they say, oh, yeah, that's the song. Like the arrangements are whatever I would bring to musicians. That's what the structure will be. You know, the structure was rarely changed. Maybe an outro might be a little bit changed or something from what my original demos were. But yeah, I would basically bring the whole song and then, you know, the, the musicians in the band would come up with some ideas for it as far as like what they would play on their instruments, maybe, you know, some other instruments that we don't normally have on when we would play live that we would add to it. So for instance, uh, let me play this transition part. This is 51 seconds. So this da 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 that that sounds like you know a major melodic riff. Is that the kind of thing like you've written that so that you're singing that at him uh -huh. or it's on your demo? So yeah, there I mean there are some riffs that you'll hear on the recordings that were maybe written into the song, and some that if you have a riff on the song, like uh, the guitar player will add other riffs that are similar throughout the song to kind of make it connect the dots, basically. Most of like the main riffs that you hear in a song are songs that were riffs that were written into the songs. So is this the same group? I know it's Jonathan Lee is your lead guitarist. And then I wrote down for My Name is Tom that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Tom Sullivan was on drums and Dave LaFollette on bass. Is that the same guys at this point in 2014 or had you switched up rhythm sections? My Name is Tom was the last album we did with that lineup. Okay. Who are the folks on Old Man Reverb then? I didn't write down the who the rhythm section that is tom courier is the bass player he was with the band for a long time teddy freese is the drummer he was also the drummer for longer than anybody way longer i want to play a little verse two to pick apart their parts a little bit let's mm -hmm. So we've got these putting little drum rolls in the in the passing tone, you know, so it can still sound simple, 
but yet it's some nice little tricks in there. I assume the bass is playing with a pick here. It has that sort of Beach Boysy feel and, you know, flies up the neck some of the time to yep. get your transitions going. How heavy handed are you in conducting these folks? <laughs> Not that heavy handed at all. We had been playing together for such a long time too that you kind of trust everybody's instincts. You know, we might make a few suggestions to each other here and there. You know, Teddy came up with a really great drum part and Tom was, had figured out exactly what to play on the songs at that point. So everything was pretty natural. Are there points of reference in terms of like, I kept thinking Beach Boys bass in some of these particular choices of riffs, but is that the kind of language that you would communicate? Yeah, I think it's easy to, with other musicians, you kind of know their frame of reference. So you just tell them, them something that they're going to relate to and, you know, oh, something like that. I want to play a little of this pre-chorus 143. Waste your time. Is that a theremin or something? What's doing the little soprano? Ooh, the, the. That's an ebo. Jonathan was playing an ebo on the guitar there. That seemed to be, okay, you know, throughout when I would hear something like, wait, is there a... Well, it clearly you had a big organ on here. Did you have a fifth player or a studio guy or was somebody filling in on that? Uh, that's our friend Morley Bartnoff. He played organ on that. He played on a, a few of the Jigsaw scene recordings during that period. And, but never, not in live unit at all? He sat in with us, I think, once, maybe more than that, but I, th I think just one time. Keyboardists are hard to keep. <laughs> I've found you know, they're all, but they're, I know, it's really true. They're always the most expendable because some of the songs will have keyboards, some of them won't. But there were a number of things on this album that he had nice little Steve Naive, you know, from Elvis Costello kind of yeah. transitional riffs and things that once you're sort of used to hearing it in the song, it's a little heartbreaking to then <laughs> to not have it there anymore. Right, I know, I'm with you. I think Tom Courier played most of the keyboards on this album. I think Morley just plays on that track. Much for brains, nothing else to rely on. Yes, there's no holding back on the lyrics on this. <laughs> <laughs> but it's self-deprecating. Yes. That's how I justify it. The idea is that as a business, this doesn't make sense at all. That the only reason you would keep doing it is sheer, well, you're calling it idiocy, but, I, you know, <laughs> moments when you're feeling nicer to yourself, it was, it's probably being internally self-sufficient, being fulfilled enough by the activity that it doesn't matter if it gets out there, all the better. There you go. <laughs> I suppose it's a matter of perspective in terms of I saw a video of you with the Ebenezer. If you can get a crowd of people <laughs> that are swarming you, I mean, is that the limit of what you can actually feel is like being in a room with appreciative people. And as long as you can get that, mm -hmm. and I assume the jigsaw scene retained enough of a following that at least you could do that in your hometown. Or were there times where it got harder than that? <laughs> we usually had to leave our hometown for that. <laughs> our hometown was never that friendly toward us. Yeah, like what is enough, basically, is what you're saying. And yeah, I think just having a fan base and just being able to make the records you want should be enough. And usually it is. Sometimes it's not, though. Well, certainly when you're trying to like, how do we raise money for the next one? Was this able to be somewhat self-supporting throughout? It's it got a very inconsistent release schedule. Let's put it that way. So we're going to quickly get to this third song from My Name is Tom, 1991. Then you have a big jump to 2000. Had the band broken up? What was going on in this? Well, I knew you'd bring up the 10-year <laughs> gaps that we had. <laughs> um, what happened was our first two records were Shortcut Through Clown Alley and My Name is Tom came out in 90 and 91. And they came out on a, an independent label in New Jersey called Skyclad Records. You know, we had gotten used to putting out records with them and we would have kept doing it, but the label folded. They went out of business and we really couldn't get another label to put out our records we, you know we just didn't i don't know we didn't have the connections or the music we were playing at the time was just not what what the labels were looking for but we kept recording throughout the 90s and finally we you know we had enough together we said yeah let's just bite the bullet and put this out ourselves so at that point we'd hooked up with this label called Eggbird in California and um they distributed the Zenith album which came out in 2000 you know we should have just put out albums on our own in the early nine, the mid nineties, but we didn't, you know, but we did re do a lot of recording. Well, Zenith might be my favorite of them. That letter to the editor song really scratches that bad finger, big star itch. That was definitely my big star uh, inspired song. <laughs> the end of the song, how do you figure out in this case, you have a really nice 
this is one that could just repeat over and over a long time that you you added that guitar riff that we were saying that that you said was part of the song that ascending da, 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 like that transition lets you repeat this as many times as you want and then throwing in this extra repeated background vocal thing sets up this nice little coda and you actually fade right <laughs> yeah uh uh-huh, fade yeah 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 I milked it for all it was worth and then faded how do you do that for a live performance of this how would you change that up? Just get really quiet. I think we would do it. We would milk it for all it was worth. And instead of fade it, we would just end it on a chord. <laughs> you know, uh, we there were songs that we used to fade though live, but this one we didn't. It seemed apt to bring up that ending before hearing my name is Tom here, because I could see how a song with a with an indefinite ending like it is with guitars could lend itself in a live setting to what you actually did on the recording of my name is Tom, which it's the title track to your 1991 album. It's the longest track. This is seven and a half minutes. That's right. <laughs> um, I was a little skeptical that you'd pick that one because I had already watched it in a live setting, which is fun, but like there's not as much going on. You know, it's, it kind of relies on the energy of the rhythm section. Whereas in this studio version is wonderfully layered. Do you want to say a little about that before we can hear that here? It's a not your typical pop song structure. I would say it's basically verse and a chorus or no, it doesn't even have a chorus before the dropout. I don't think. Yeah. The chorus doesn't come till two and a half minutes in. Yeah, so after the breakdown, it comes into the first chorus. So it's a very unusual structure. Then it's like it has two guitar solos in it, and it's just kind of a Eastern-y, dirge type of thing. Where I wrote the song when I first moved to California in 1982. The band Alter Legion, we, we moved out here, and I got an apartment in Hollywood. I was out here by myself. I moved here before the band did to kind of get things set up. And I would just sit on my bed and just strum the guitar, and I looked out my window. And there's a woman right across the apartment building taking a shower with no curtains on for everybody to see, basically. So I would just strum my guitar and watch her. Not in a weird way. It was all scientific. And that that inspired this song. Actually, I have a specific memory during my year after college when I was in this weird house and I'm standing on my bed playing bass. Like, I think I was actually recording something and I look out and there's like a naked woman in the next building and I immediately just like, with my bass, like, I don't want to embarrass anybody, you know. A bass can hide a lot. But it seems somehow more innocent if you're actively playing an instrument, because that's not what peeping toms do. <laughs> they don't? I stand outside your window <laughs> playing a guitar. The weird part of that story to me is you were standing on your bed playing well, bass. Well, it was a small, it was a small room. I had <laughs> a large bed with recording equipment on it. Oh, I'll buy that. That was somewhere around this. That was only a couple years after this recording. Shatter anxious 
Gently responding to the breeze Inside your garments are discarded one by one Across a chair your scarf is casually spun Waste your neurotic fears so I can drop a bomb I'm not your granny dear And I am not your mom My name is Tom My name is Tom 
just the fact that before the raga part comes in, it sounds like this is going to be a Tom Petty song. You know, that's a nice like meat and potatoes guitar riff. But then once you add the little fake sitar thing over it, like, oh, oh, no, this is something else. (laughs) We're going to have little, is it finger symbols? There are. Yeah, exactly. There are finger symbols. Yep. Is it just a matter of the tone to make it have that sitar sound? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's not a sitar on this song. It's it's the guitar. Yeah. Uh huh. Yep. Okay. We just make it a little more pointy than it would <laughs> normally be, and can fake that well enough. And then, what made you guys? Usually, a drone does not have a sixteenth note machine gun toms through the whole song. <laughs> usually, it's just like let's put a little bit of cymbals in there or something. Not. It was never supposed to be a gentle song. It was supposed. This is a song that I'd written in eighty two. We originally played this song with my band at the time, Alter Legion. The drummer at the time, you know, I kind of told him what I had in mind and he played that beat. I always loved the beat. It was just so intense and pounding. I thought it was perfect for this song. It just didn't seem like it should be a gentle song, but it does have the breakdown verse that has the gentler but ominous side of the song, I guess. There are definitely elements of like the very old Pink Floyd in here. What is your reference point for, is it the uh, Satanic Majesty's request, you know, these 60s Raga things, which normally, of course, don't have giant toms. They're more mellow. So you can just, I guess it's different drugs. Yeah, well, to tell you the truth, at that time, I wasn't listening to a lot of 60s music. We used to listen to belly dancing records. Uh, our guitar player, George from Alter Legion, his parents were Greek and he had all these belly dancing records. So we, we would rehearse at his house and listen to those. That was really the inspiration for the Eastern style music on this song. You know, of course, I knew that 60s bands had done that to death, and um, but I still wanted to write a song like that. That's interesting. I mean, that's a much more sort of authentic basis for writing a song like this than I really love Donovan and I, you know, kind of am living in that. But you've got words like now languish in your vestibule and things like this that have, (laughs) yeah, do you know where, again, I could interpret that as that's the kind of, not twee, but it's sort of a delicate 60s Donovan-ish sensibility, but you're saying this is not coming from that place. Do you know? Yeah, I wasn't listening to that music then. What is this song even about? This person coming into your house, putting your keys down, just leaves flowers on your porch and, uh, you know, like a stalker, I guess you would call it. Although, you know, he is buying the lady flowers. Come on. I mean, the story is obviously fictional, except for the inspiration behind it. And then something weird happens, but you don't know what it is. Your left eye twitches as it pounds the window pane. You're just talking about the rain, but is the rain pounding the window pane or is your eye pounding the window pane? So you never really know is somebody getting killed in this or injured or what's going on? Or am I just describing the rain? Yes, in the chorus itself, brace your neurotic fear so I can drop a bomb. I'm going to drop it on you. I'm not your granny. I'm not your mom. My name's Tom. That's the climax is that we're going <laughs> to, we're going to put all this sinister energy into a nicely harmonized just reinforcement of the raga. Yeah, it's a way to introduce yourself. Well, it centers the song in the same way that do, 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 you know, in the museum piece does, that we've got that to put a cap on the, the chorus itself is not the release, right? The energy goes up and it's only really because I just listened to you do the Who song tattoo. I really hear in the tone of the voice here, this could exactly be, you know, a Roger Daltrey mid 60s the way that's is engineered and delivered in this chorus. Uh And the fact that that then resolves to, you know, we've got this release for just two lines and then we're back to the minor key, the relentless dirge pretty quickly. I remember hearing Pete Townsend talk about like, okay, when you, when you have the middle eight, you got to release it a little bit. You got to go somewhere, but not too far. Right. You can't. And so this is, you know, very firmly rooted, I guess, as every Raga sort of thing has to be. I mean, you don't actually have the drone you know, an actual separate instrument, your low, what is it, the lowest note on the sitar? What, I, I'm not sure what, you know, often does that, or you could do a uh, didgeridoo, <laughs> kind of a, something to just take up that bass space. But it, you're doing this with a four-piece regular, for the most part, rock ensemble here. But I guess there's a lot of, what is it, get up to four guitars at some point here, do you know? There's definitely a lot of some layering going on. Let's see, there's one rhythm guitar, one rhythm electric all the way through, and then there's I don't remember if it's one or two acoustic guitars. And then Jonathan played, geez, probably the guitar solo is a different part. And then the the riff, the main riff. So he's got several guitars. I'm not sure how many. Sure. 
At one point, I thought, okay, is there a Mellotron coming in here? But no, that's just no, the yeah, there's guitar, no keyboards on the song, the right. Ebo or whatever he's doing to. Yeah, I don't think there's Ebo on it okay. either. It's just guitar thrown in. This was a fun one to play live. You lose the advantages of the layering, but the rhythm section just gets to go hog wild. I mean, you're like the central person rooting things down that, you know, playing basically the same guitar riff for a long time. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's the uh, I want to be your dog E chord. Uh-huh. Is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> it was always a showstopper live. That was all, you know, we always kind of had to do that song. At first we'd close with it, then we thought, nah, it's too predictable to, to close with it. So you just stick it somewhere in the set and try to recover from it. Yeah, so this seemed a very tight lineup. You were saying that, though, this was the last one for this lineup. Was it because the label folded, or were there other things going on? Just normal turnover. <laughs> yeah, it just normal toner, turnover, I guess, yeah. I mean, I have found, you know, with rhythm sections in particular, of course you can find somebody who everybody gets along as people and you just like hanging out together and maybe that's the way to have a stable. I don't know. Is that more the description of, you said this, you've had a pretty long standing lineup through the 2000s to the end of the band, as opposed to when you have young people involved in a growing concern and like, oh, now we've just gotten to a label or we have label interest or we're just, it's very much, I've found at least drummers have so many opportunities. <laughs> And if you're not getting them the gigs, then they'll go somewhere else. You know, so I've had more turnover in drummers and bass players. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Well, well, Teddy, we stole him from another band at the time, or I think we actually borrowed him technically. And but yeah, that's true. Like drummers definitely are more, you know, free agents generally. Just musicians are just hard to find in general as far as like just finding people who share similar musical influences or even if they're not that similar, but they, you know, they just have a good knowledge of what you want to do and, you know, how to interpret it. And and also you have to have a certain level of competence. I'm not I'm not all that into competence or <laughs> musicianship, but you have to have a certain level of competence to play these songs. Well, I think so. In L.A., was it quite a bit easier than Baltimore in terms of just the sheer pool of people? No. You'd think. I, I, that's that's what I thought when I moved here. Oh, it'd be so easy to find people, but it really was not at all. It wasn't, wasn't easy. Well, I guess if there's more activity, there's more distractions that, that uh, you know, so I was in Ann Arbor in college and it was a certain pool of people there, but then went to Austin, which so many more opportunities, so many more musicians. But again, like every drummer is in three bands, every... <laughs> players in four, you know, it becomes a more uh, mercenary activity. In those days, I really wanted people that were just in this particular band. I didn't want people who were playing in a lot of bands. So that, that was kind of difficult, too, to find people who were willing to just be in your band and, you know, not play with every band in town. Well, I didn't look. Did you give co-writing credit to any of these folks on any of the stuff? Or it's always just you bringing the songs and... Well, there were a few songs that other members would bring to the table as far as like they'd have like a riff or, you know, partial melody or uh, or even a chord progression. And it just he asked me to write a melody or I always wrote all the words. I guess like, you know, we probably recorded like 80 or so songs with the jigsaw scene. And I guess I wrote 70 of them, probably just me. And then there were maybe eight or nine so semi-collaboration type things. So what is the next thing? Are you working on more solo material? Is the band going to play together at some point? No, I think the band's done. We ended that. So yeah, I'm working on two albums at the same time right now. That's only because I can't figure out which one I'd like to do first. I'm just doing them both right now because I can't get into the studio right now anyway because of this. I don't know if you heard about this pandemic thing. But <laughs> really? I just heard about it last week, but it seems to be a big deal. So yeah, so I'm just doing as much recording as I can at home and go. I'll go into the studio when, when things open back up and get it rolling. Well, let's wrap up by hearing one more off the new album, Book of Strongman 2020, Shadow of a Tall Tree. So this is like the big single, right? The big single. You got <laughs> going to be flying off the charts. Yep. Yep. <laughs> but do you have a few words about that before uh, to send folks off what they will expect here? What is this song actually about? Shadow on a Tall Tree is really about nature controlling everything. No matter what we do, it's really up to nature the way things turn out. Nature even controls the shadows. So it's kind of about that. Each verse is about an entirely different thing. So the verses really don't have anything to do with the choruses other than here's a scenario, here's a scenario. And then the chorus goes to the shadow on a tall tree section that says whatever I've described during the verse doesn't really matter because nature will control everything ultimately. 
Nice. All right. Well, that's a wonderful, <laughs> cheery nice. thought to leave on. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was really fun going in depth with the songs like that. You really did your homework. All right. Here's Shadow of a Tall Tree. Thanks so much to Dennis. He's got a really fun set of albums. There are several songs that I really liked that we did not get to talk about. I will link to those from the blog post accompanying this at nakedlyexaminedmusic.com. And you can learn more by checking out dennisdavisonmusic.com. If you are not aware, I maintain a Spotify playlist of all the songs covered on this podcast that are on Spotify. I add them as I'm making the decision. Sometimes you'll even hear the false starts. Anyway, you can find the link to that at nakedleagueexaminedmusic.com. My next interview will be with Jay Gonzalez, keyboardist for the Drive-By Truckers, with some really nice solo albums. After that will be Nels Klein, and I just interviewed Steve Almas. 
another guy who started as a punker with the Suicide Commandos, but he ended up being a country rock guy. Really good songs. Hope you come back and listen to those interviews. I really filled up my plate with great interviews going forward. I'm booked out a full three months, a couple of them with artists I have wanted to talk to for a long time. So that's the main thing that's pushing me forward here. As I was editing this episode, I keep thinking, am I asking the same questions? Trying to get out of these people who exactly they were channeling. Incidentally, that was uh, the intro to the birds here without you, that riff that we focused on during the first song. But hey, it's just an assertion of the minor key. It's fine. So maybe I'll try to talk less in the interviews. I don't know. Sometimes it feels like the most natural thing in the world. Sometimes it feels like I'm challenging their creative decisions, but at least they're not taking offense. So I guess I'll keep at this. Again, if you want to support the effort, and I strongly encourage you to do so, why not head to patreon.com slash nakedly examine music, sign up for a small per episode donation. You get the ad free feed, you get the show notes. It'll help ensure that this keeps going. And as always, I welcome your suggestions for guests or maybe you or someone who wants to be on the show, feel free to reach out and just say hi through Patreon or through mark at nakedlyexaminedmusic.com. Hope you're doing well. Maybe being creative. Thank you so much for listening. Maybe keep on musicking. Until next time, this is Mark Vincent Meyer signing off.